Western governments are waking up to the cold hard truth that the war in Ukraine is lost and the entire future of geopolitics have been changed forever. In recent weeks, we've seen a plethora of new Western articles that are saying the hard truth out loud. Here is the Wall Street Journal stating, it's time to end magical thinking about Russia's defeat. And here is a foreign affairs article written by Richard Haas, one of America's most important geopolitical think tank advisors advocating for the U.S. to redefine what success means in Ukraine. It sounds like a confession, but it's simply how fast things can change. Let's go back to May 2023, when U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham personally met with Ukraine Zelensky and delivered this message. Free or die. Free or die. Now you are free. Yes. And we will be. And the Russians are dying. So the best money we've ever spent. Thank you so much. No, it's best money the U.S. government has ever spent? Wow, what a statement. It sounds like Lindsey Graham is in it for the long haul and committed to fighting for Ukraine for however long it takes. But look at how fast Lindsey completely reverses his position in a new interview given just this past week. So I will not vote for any aid until we secure our own border. Reform asylum, reform reform parole is possible to do. Democrats don't want to do it. All Republicans want to do it. I'm not helping Ukraine until we help ourselves. I'm sorry, what was that? I'm not helping Ukraine until we help ourselves? What happened to the best money we ever spent? Honestly, I feel bad for the Ukrainians who were told by Boris Johnson to walk away from a peace deal in March 2022 and instead fight for their freedom. Now the Financial Times reports that funding to Ukraine will officially run out by the end of the year. The reality of the situation is the West grossly miscalculated how to deal with Russia. The West thought if we could band together, throw hundreds of billions of dollars to Ukraine, we could cripple Russia's economy, force an uprise amongst Russian citizens, and who knows, maybe even start a revolution and overthrow Putin as president. It was a lofty goal. But to be honest, it was too emotional of a goal and not at all realistic. We know for a fact the U.S. government would love more than anything to overthrow the ruling governments in Russia and China. Nothing would make U.S. politicians happier than seeing these countries turn into liberal democracies. But once again, we need to remove our emotions and simply look at the facts. I found an incredible article this week in Der Spiegel, a German political magazine that is one of the most influential political resources in continental Europe. The article is entitled, Why Putin Has Every Reason to Be Happy With Himself. Before we break down this article, I want to stress just how significant this is for a German magazine like Der Spiegel to publish an article like this. Germany is the largest and most important economy in all of Europe. It has been the biggest European supporter to Ukraine, and most Germans are very traditional in their mindset. They most definitely don't support Putin and believe the battle between Russia and Ukraine is a battle between democracy and autocracy, a battle between good versus evil. And no matter what, even if your close ally on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean destroys your pipeline and access to the cheap natural gas which powers your economy, Ukraine must prevail. But now, even the Germans are realizing what actually happened these past two years. Let's break it down. Russia's economy has grown since the invasion, largely due to the massive increases in arms production. Putin has not become an international pariah. Instead, he recently spoke at eye level with Olaf Scholz and other heads of the government at a virtual G20 meeting. In fact, Putin has now been invited to the Middle East to meet with the UAE and Saudi Arabia to discuss the Israel-Hamas war. Domestically, the autocrat is in no trouble and even on the battlefield things are going better again. Ukrainians now fear that Putin's soldiers could go on the offensive and occupy new territory. The Russian president enjoys his run and displays a self-confidence that is difficult to bear. Putin proudly stated, We have become stronger in a widely watched video message to the meeting of the World Council of the Russian People, an organization under the Russian Orthodox Church. Putin raved about the annexation of Ukrainian territories and that Russia had regained its sovereignty as a world power. The fuel for the Russian economy, even in the second year of the war, is the persistently high price of oil. It has not been possible to limit Russia's revenue from fossil raw materials. The switch to a war economy may not be particularly sustainable or unhealthy economic policy, but it works in the short and probably medium term, 
and generates growth from which Russians ultimately benefit. Perhaps no greater indication of this is an unemployment rate that is at a historical low. In September 2020, Russian unemployment was 6.3%. Fast forward to July 2023, and it's been more than half and down to only 3%. Russia's construction industry is even reporting records, meaning the economic collapse longed for in the West simply will not happen. Russia is not only maneuvering its way around the sanctions with the help of China and other non-democratic partner countries, but Moscow continues to benefit from the fact that the same countries who first introduced these sanctions do not close existing loopholes. By far, the best example I can show you is this chart which highlights German export to Kyrgyzstan. German exports of motor vehicles and parts, which are highlighted in blue, are up a staggering 5,500% since Russia invaded Ukraine. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that all of these automobiles and parts are heading to Russia. It's not like Kyrgyzstan had a sudden economic boom and now all of its citizens want to buy Mercedes and BMWs. While the German government broadcasts to the world its solidarity for Ukraine, German companies are working behind the scenes to find creative ways to sell their products to Russia. That's the cold hard truth, and it's just one of the many reasons why sanctions ultimately never work. But what about the Russian people? Are they growing tired of a war and becoming desperate for it to end? Expert sociologists still see no evidence of growing war weariness amongst the Russian population, at least none that could turn into activism. A significant number of Russians do in fact want negotiations, but only those that end with Russia's war gains being cemented. Perhaps the biggest takeaway from this article in Der Spiegel is the author's following confession. Putin's role, unfortunately, there is no way to sugarcoat it is more stable and more unchallenged than it has been for a long time. According to the current interim results, Putin is the winner. His regime has become even more stable after two years of bloodshed. Now everyone, please don't misunderstand the message from today's video. I'm not praising or supporting Putin. Quite frankly, I'm not a fan of Putin or his actions in Ukraine but I'm also a realist and simply analyze the facts of every situation. Here is a fascinating insight from Robin Brooks, the chief economist at the Institute of International Finance in Washington, D.C. He states, You have to wonder what's going on in the EU. Russia's current account surplus, based on tax revenues for November 2023, is rising further, giving Putin more cash for war. Meanwhile, the complete opposite is true for Ukraine. Drain on Ukraine's official FX reserves is back to as big as right after Russia first invaded. As a result, Ukraine is increasingly struggling for cash, even as Russia is back to large and rising current account surpluses. This could have been avoided, but the EU chose not to. Remember when I opened today's video and shared with you the war in Ukraine will change the entire future of geopolitics? Well, it's time to give you a concrete example. In recent months, we've seen several coup governments and domestic uprisings in Africa. But these uprisings aren't about human rights or democracy. It's about who gets access to important commodities. With soaring inflation, a declining US dollar, commodities are skyrocketing around the world. Look no further than gold, which had an all-time high earlier this week. To help you better understand how important commodities are, check out this fascinating graph detailing the critical minerals needed for the future of China, EU, and U.S. security. China leads in mineral processing, controlling 100% of the world's refined supply of natural graphite, over 90% of manganese, 70% of cobalt, nearly 60% of lithium, which we'll get to in a minute, and 40% of copper refining. Zoom into the center of this chart and you'll see 10 critical minerals essential to the future of US, EU, and China. And one of the most important is lithium. Everyone, today's video is sponsored by Eureka Lithium, which trades under the symbol U-R-E-K-F. But let's take a moment and break down why lithium is so important to the future of our world. Earlier this week, I read a fascinating article from The Economist entitled, China is winning Africa's white gold rush for lithium. The author makes a very strong argument that China's grip on clean energy minerals has become a major challenge for the West. And according to a local expert, China is buying any lithium it can find and creating an absolute feeding frenzy. Just look at this chart, which shows China's mineral and metal imports from Africa, rising nearly 500% in the past decade to almost $50 billion annually. Of course, lithium is vital to the EV industry, which is growing in popularity in both China and the West. BYD is China's fastest growing car brand and sold a record 287,000 EV cars in the month of September alone. 
Meanwhile, major American companies like ExxonMobil is drilling the first lithium well in Arkansas, aiming to be a leading supplier for EVs by 2030. Quite frankly, EV manufacturers can't risk political instability anymore and are going straight to the source, a tactic we don't see with any other commodity. Okay, it's abundantly clear the importance of lithium, but what's the specific opportunity with Eureka Lithium? Let me break down three compelling points about this company. The first is the lead prospector, Sean Ryan. Sean is Canada's most famous prospector and has extensive experience mining gold. He's won Prospector of the Year Award three times throughout his career and his techniques have literally changed how the mining industry operates in Canada. Sean pioneered an exploration technique called Drone to Drills, which uses powerful drones to analyze potential sites and reduce exploration costs by roughly 70%. The bottom line is mining companies absolutely need a person with proven track records on the team and Sean Ryan is one of the most qualified prospectors around. It also helps that he's one of the largest shareholders of Eureka Lithium, which aligns him with investors and proves he has a lot of skin in the game and much to gain from a successful operation. The second factor I want to address is the actual location of the mine, which is in Nunavik, Canada. Nunavik is the northern third of Quebec province and has a first mover's advantage in the space of lithium mining. Now, Quebec is a well-known spot for lithium mining, but the majority of mines are in the southern St. James Bay region. But notice how bright and condensed the lithium content is in Raglan West and South, the two biggest regions where Eureka Lithium is operating. There is a lot of potential in this region, which leads me to the third and final factor. Where is the smart money going? To answer this question, just look at this map of the Nunavik region and where a high-profile mining company is actively buying land. Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and Richard Branson are among key investors in the privately held Cobalt Metals. Backed by some of the world's smartest businessmen, Cobalt uses AI technology to discover potential opportunities in the mining sector. It's always a good sign when smart money like this is also investing in the region, and Nunavik has the potential to become the next hotspot for mining in Canada. In closing, I invite you to do more research on Eureka Lithium as they have a lot of things trending in the right direction. They have no debt, a cash position of over 3.2 million Canadian dollars, and own the new projects in Nunavik 100% outright. At the time of this recording, the stock is trading around 39 cents and has a market cap of $27 million. But as always, please do your own due diligence and research before buying any stock or commodity. And to help you out with that, I'm going to be dropping the investor presentation and a link to the Eureka Lithium website down in the description below. Thank you all for watching today's presentation, and I look forward to seeing you all in our next video soon.